Basil has asked, hi guys, please talk about the new Cisco One Silicon. So um, uh, Drew to? and Greg, I think you guys have dug into that a bit, right? <laughs> I'm not sure what else is researched. I look at it and said, oh gosh, another ASIC. And I went, oh. Uh, Farrell, okay. let's start with you. I think you, you've done some homework and have an opinion because you always have an opinion. That's who you are. It's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to dig up my notes that I prepped. Uh, we talked about the, this a lot on the Network Break podcast this week. So if you, wanna, and, uh, uh, if you want more than what we got there and if you want to hear it again, head on over to the Network Break podcast on Packer Pushes and listen to this week's show, the 18th of December. Um, basically, Cisco's um, in 2016, Cisco bought a company called Libar Systems which is an Israeli company that is a fabulous semiconductor. That is, they sit around designing sil silicon every single day. Um, and between 2016 and here today, 2019, Cisco has been spinning this ASIC. And since 2017, it's been out uh, selling it to customers and saying, is this what you want? Is this what you want? Is this, what, is this really what you want? Uh, that's what they said during the presentation <laughs> while calling it an innovation. Uh, Liba Systems, I'm told, so the genesis of Liba Systems is that they're actually the people who were behind the Jericho Silicon that's now at Broadcom. So um, the Jericho Silicon is the chipset that drives the high-end Broadcom system. So if you're building a chassis around the Broadcom ASIC family, uh, if you're trying to build a router, not a, not a high-end router, there's certain things, um, the Jericho chipset is the one. It's not a top of rack. It's not a chassis Ethernet type of solution. It is um, something that sits way up in the high-end um, in the router space. So at this point in time, Cisco has announced that they're making the ASIC, Perhaps the most interesting part about the ASIC is they're not only going to use it in their own silicon, uh, in their own chassis, and they announced a new series of 8,000 series routers, which will be sold to service providers, and in particular to cloud companies. So the, the hope is that there are cloud companies who have got very high 400 gig type bandwidth to the internet, and they want to have a high speed routing type silicon that faces the internet. Um, uh, the second thing is they're going to sell the ASIC independently. So for companies who wish to buy the ASIC to put into their own white box. Mm. So you think again of people like Microsoft and Facebook, who today are struggling to find big routers, white box routers that go at the front end because the ASICs that go out there, the Jericho isn't quite right. So maybe Russ can talk a little bit later on why Jericho isn't the perfect routing silicon yet, or the June silicon isn't, if he knows the answers there. Um, but then this silicon is going to be there for that. And then, of course, they also talked about um, uh, the iOS XR. So there's a new version of iOS XR, which is version 7. It's uh, still based on Wind River Linux, but they've changed it back to more of a monolithic infrastructure. So in iOS 6, they unpacked it and went back to... Um, to, a, to an architecture of modular containers and every part of the Cisco stack was in its own container and you could fiddle with it and you could discombobulate it and rebundle it as you liked. And in iOS XR7, they've gone to a more bundled model and then implemented their pay-as-you-use licensing model on the top of it. Um, I, I've had a few discussions. I don't know if anybody from the panel wants to ask me a question about it, but I've had a few questions uh, uh, from people here about uh, reasonably can Cisco make this work? Uh, one person I was talking to was asking whether Cisco can make this work. So if you think about it in terms of a 100 gig router ports, if you sell, a, if Cisco sells say a, a million 100 gig router ports in the next five years, then that means that they'll only need about 10,000 chips, maybe, maybe less, maybe more. So that means for the billion dollars they spent getting this company off the ground, including 300 million to buy Libar systems, you're looking at something in the order of $30,000 a chip, an ASIC. That's just cost price. And if they can get, scale it up a bit further, maybe get a bit higher, maybe they can get it down to about $20,000 an ASIC. But that is not a cheap ASIC. Uh, Broadcom um, is certainly able to compete here. They've got the Jericho 2s out. No doubt they've got a bunch of Jerichos coming down the pipeline. The speculation is that within a year or two, they'll have a successor that will be interested to this. Uh, what makes this a routing silicon, I think, is a good question. The answer here is it has um, a non-blocking internal architecture, which unlike a switch, which switches non-blocking, this is uh, routing, so you can have very high density virtual output queues on it. It also supports uh, very high levels of TCAM, uh, everything's 50 gig, so it's a 50 gig SIRDES. Every, every part of the IOs is 50 gig in and out, so it's designed for 400 gig interfaces. And the last part about this is it also supports external memory. So 
as you are asking routers to have very large TCAM tables or very large routing tables, you can actually attach those to an external memory casing. And this is common to a number of other ASICs these days where you can use a special type of high-speed DRAM called DXC RAM, if I remember rightly, or DX RAM. And this is very high speed. It's not static RAM and it's not on the chip, but very high speed so you can hold a mm. couple of million, five million BGP routes in the ASIC or near to the ASIC. So it's not a switching silicon. Don't try and compare it to a Trident or a Tomahawk. It's a June Jericho, but it's superior to and past that. So it sounds like the impact of this is going to be again service provider market. This I'm glad I only asked you for your top of the top of your head opinion. You know, because clearly you haven't done any research and have no opinion, honestly. Uh, but this, I mean, well, the, the, again, service provider oriented, cloud provider oriented, very large scale oriented. Not yeah. um, the enterprise isn't going to see. A, there's no use case in the enterprise for this chip for the most part. Not well, yet. Not well, for the mid market. It's yeah. very. It's a very programmable chipset. Um, mm -hmm. more so than Jericho because it has a lot of cores. It's very similar to Ericsson spider chip, which nobody's going to know what I'm talking about when I say that, but mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, it's like a thousand cores or 500 cores or something crazy like that. So there's a lot of parallelism. And so you can do a lot of programmability with it. Um, I personally see this more as a swipe at Broadcom myself than mm -hmm. anything else. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely an angle of that. You know, we don't want to be stuck with Broadcom and the Silicon. We need to be in some control of our thing, but I'm not sure that a billion dollars worth of investment. They were very big on saying a billion dollars over and over. Well, they also said the word innovation at a rate of up to three times per minute. I was actually counting. <laughs> <It> was quite... <laughs> I'm not sure. That... <laughs> um, but as Russ says, because it's multi-threaded, it means it can um, process a very large number of flows. It can do things like quos across the vo the VOQs and things like that. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. So, and they're saying it's going to be a single chip that's going to go right across the line. So, Silicon One is the first is a whole family of silicon that they sort of teased that this is just the first chip. It's not the last chip, and they called the current generation the Q100, which is implying that there'll be Q200 and you know whatever going on all the way. One of the things they made a big deal about is that they're going to use this as a platform to build a variety of chip families. So I think we will see it probably come down into switches at some point. Ethan, you mentioned is this just for service providers? At the outset, yes, but I can imagine them, you know, needing an excuse to get customers to upgrade their equipment. They're going to roll out uh, a line of, of switches using this chip as well. Hmm. Now, Russ, you said a swipe at Broadcom. You know, there's a lot of ways you could take that. I mean, does it does it swipe into Broadcom's uh, production capability because some fab had to switch over to Cisco to make this? Or the, is it that kind of volume, or is it mostly just, hey, we still make A62 Broadcom. You can't have it all. No, I, I think it's even more than that because they're releasing this to other white box makers, so they are directly competing with Broadcom and Bar in Broadcom's home territory, in effect. Hmm. Um, which are they is, going to make the SDKs more more readily available? You know, Broadcom's been criticized for making it uh, difficult to access some of that stuff. They're supporting know. P4, so it's openly programmable. It, it, yeah, is, is P4 all we need in this case, or do we're going to need any any deeper magic uh, to expose everything that we need to expose on that chip? Well, I mean, I don't know. P4 is pretty deep as it is, so it's hard yeah. to. I, it's, I don't know. It's going to be, I guess it's a th one of those things where it says time will tell, right? Are they going to go down the side path and just open things that they want to open and then keep the rest hmm. for themselves? Or are they truly going to open it up and try to change the market? I'm so, not entirely certain. Yeah. So the Silicon, during the presentation, they talked about having Sonic compatibility. So Microsoft can pick this up. Microsoft is the natural target for this. Um, uh, Microsoft has been buying Juniper and Arista routers to use as uh, an Arista chassis in a routing mode to handle the front end routing. And the speculation would be that Microsoft is looking for a more capable ASIC to run its own operating system, which is based on the Sonic API. Um, it's also definitely a shot at Broadcom, but uh, I also noticed some tweets from various people, notably Martin Casado. He's saying, finally, Cisco's going back to something that it's good at. And that's true that Cisco <laughs> has been very good at, making silicon for 20 yeah. or 30 years and it kind of walked away from it and, and i mean yeah, it's Drew funny and greg I was... not that many years ago we were talking about merchant silicon and, and and the point had come up that uh you know considering how many chips cisco makes they're kind of merchant silicon too in a way and yeah. uh, you know that that was their bread and butter yeah. well i think they have to sell it to other people to make the numbers work like if you're going to produce a chip 
and spend a billion dollars. You can't just produce 10,000 or 20,000 of them just so you've got a product to sell. You have to make this work at scale because Broadcom's there competing with you and Intel just bought Barefoot. So they've got Tofino, you've got Anovium coming out. Cisco can't sit there fat and pretty producing a chip at whatever price it chooses to charge for it and suck customers are going to suck it up and just compete yeah. with Juniper. They are going to have, they've got competitors, right? It's not the market of 10 years ago when they could make whatever they liked and take however long they liked and people would buy whatever they shipped. So it is different. Um, yeah, I think, just on I, think, the, yeah. I was just going to say, I think the sonic compatibility is a really interesting piece because that does imply, it does imply Psy, right? Because mm-hmm. Sonic runs around Psy. And yeah. it does, and, and P4, of course, Sonic P4 will work with Psy. But the sonic uh, compatibility is really, really an interesting piece of this. Mm-hmm. So I spoke, I reached out to somebody who knows more about the Broadcom APIs than we do. Um, Drew did actually. So, and um, they got a message back from somebody who actually does this sort of stuff. And he said, it's a step in the right direct. Um, Broadcom recently opened up its APIs a lot more so that there's a lot more ease of use. Normally when you wrote code on the Broadcoms, you had to go and sign away an NDA that basically said you couldn't even mention that you're working on Broadcom ASICs. It was a really draconian thing and we couldn't get any information about it. Uh, But somebody who's still working on that said um, the current opening of the APIs and the code that Broadcom is putting up on GitHub is a step in the right direction. The public programming interface appears to be just as featureful as the proprietary SDK, but the implementation is still distributed as a binary it's not much different from other vendors. So there's still a binary that sits above the chip and you have to get that from the vendor. So it's not open where you can do whatever you like. The vendors are still keeping control, but they're steadily moving to make the binary freely available. You don't have to go on 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 knees begging to get access to the binaries and have a license (laughs) to write code. And so so this is where to be clear, you're talking about Broadcom here, not Cisco, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Cisco's doing the same thing. If you want to sign up, I think the chances of Arista getting access to the Cisco Silicon One Q100 ASIC to put into one of their boxes is pretty slim, I would suggest. (laughs) But so so then it's the same model as Broadcom. So therefore, you're back into the Psi P4 thing, which is okay because what Psi is basically is it's a pluggable architecture with DLLs for each. If you want to call them DLLs, I mean they call them plug plugins or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. It's a modular, modular code base. So what do I think? I think this is great. I think this is what Cisco needs to do. It needs to, and I mean, Drew can throw, throw some opinions on the table here as well, but I think Cisco had to do this. They're not making any traction with the other things that they've done. They've gone off and bought companies like AppDynamics and Jasper and AI companies, (coughs) service provider market shrinking, enterprise market is stagnant for them. They're not growing. Shareholders are expecting them to grow the last quarter. They you know, didn't, they're telling that, that, that they're not growing. So they have to do something. And so to pivot back to Silicon makes good sense. And the only, but however, it's not the market that it was five years ago, they have to sell this chip to other people as a chip. So we may actually see white box units shipping out of China with an operating system. And that might work for Facebook or Oracle or those types of organizations who don't have the, the sort of financial clout to make a billion dollars worth of Silicon, but do want to have a big end router that's, that's in their control where they own the ASIC, the physical chassis design because they want airflow, you know, they want it to be in a 24 inch chassis because their racks are some custom architecture and they want to be able to choose that. So that, that opens it up, I think. Hey, Tommy, do you, do you care about this chip at all in, in your world? Is this anything that's going to impact sales projects? Anything interesting here? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. So, uh, wow. our, our largest customer might be interested, but they're even, even the fact that they're doing some crazy automation with a handful of developers on tap, they, they don't want to program an ASIC. They don't want to program a chip. In a router, they just want to put a config in a router. They're, well, to be fair, this is, being, this is being aimed at a service provider who may, mm-hmm. in a white box environment, want that programmability depending on their use cases. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think I think it's going to make a big impact. I, I see what you know what it's going to enable. So, I don't mm. think my enterprise customers are going to buy it though. Not anytime soon. Mm. They'll, they'll buy it, you know, abstract from as a service from someone else maybe, and they'll flow mm. through it, but they're not going to buy it. Mm. I'm curious how this is going to stack up against what AWS has traditionally been doing, which is developing their own chips. Because we talked about how this is aimed at Microsoft to a certain degree because it can take advantage of Sonic, but AWS does their own thing. Um, I don't even know what kind of networking gear they have in their facilities, and I don't know if they've ever actually said 
but I know at least the, the chip that's on their servers is 100% theirs. And I'm imagining that they're doing similar things at the edge with their routing and switching. So I'm curious if they're going to hmm. eventually just have their own routing chipset and maybe make that available as a competitor. To sell. <laughs> well, well, I don't know about a chipset, but I do know they're making some interesting hires right now. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I know some of what the AWS networking stack is. I don't could be could be a play here. It's a, it's an interesting question. There. Would be would be more of a software play, more of a we'll ship this as part of Outpost or something like that would be the way yeah. I would see it, rather mm. than something they mm. retail. Although, you know, it is something I have thought about in the last couple of weeks of what it does to the vendors if AWS decides to ship white box with their own OS. Again, given the hires they're making, who knows? Right. Yeah, they've yeah. been traditionally they've been all software. Uh, but, you know, using their own hardware in their own data centers. But now they're moving outside of those data centers. They've set up outposts, which ships into your data center. But then they also set up outposts. They call them local zones, right. which is like a mini data Fog center. Yeah. No, this is something different from Wavelength. Oh, <laughs> so, Wavelength, yeah, that's yeah. Right, yeah. So outpost local zone, they have one in LA. And basically, it's a smaller footprint data center that has a bunch of those outposts that are still managed by AWS. And I think they're multi-tenant. But it's a way to get closer proximity uh, to wherever you are, but not it's not going into the Verizon data center yeah. or, or I think AWS could use the Silicon One family of products, but they would just buy the ASIC oh, yeah. and yeah. go from there, right? And they'd get a license from Cisco. Now, whether they would do that um, instead of doing their own Silicon, perhaps, or whether they would continue to work with Broadcom to get the Silicon that they want. Um, and also it would be bad to gamble against Broadcom making an iteration in 12 to 24 months that you couldn't that and catching up. So mm -hmm. it's going to be an interesting market. I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I think one other thing that they talked about in the same session and you can't really separate it. The Cisco one Silicon announcement also include a lot of discussion around Silicon photonics and how Cisco is now returning to manufacturing its own SFPs. So it literally mm -hmm. owns a Silicon photonics company and it's now binding those into its own SFPs and it will now sell Cisco SFPs or, you know, whatever the module might be for 400 gig, um, straight to market. So you'll be able to buy them as standalone products in the open market. Cisco will sell them independently again. You'll also be able to buy them as part of Cisco's products. Um, and they're making a big deal that Cisco SFPs are better quality, higher something, better qualified. They've got mystic magical source inside and that's the unique part about it. So that <laughs> remains to be seen. Um, but that is unique. I mean, that basically what they've done there is bought the whole stack. They'll still be outsourcing some of the manufacture, uh, but they own the silicon photonics licenses and the manufacturing for that. And then they'll outsource the actual assembly of the, of the SFP. So that is a major change for Cisco. It's a return to, and I'd expect broadly to see Cisco to produce a family of proprietary optic modules. Like we've already seen them produce these bi-directional 40 gigs and bi-directional optics in various speeds where they use less cable than others and all that sort of stuff. I'd expect mm -hmm. them to do more of that, of that, you know, standards plus, <laughs> when when somebody says standards plus that's just proprietary right but that sort of stuff but if they can add some value there for customers and customers are smart enough to understand that they're being sucked into a lock-in then that's okay 